first. We're just look at a map. There's a lot of red going across. So, yeah, it was what everybody predicted. The Republicans took over the House. Didn't make it in the Senate. There's three still Senate races that are too close to call, but it just doesn't look like that's going to happen. Uh, you see, I've, I've actually heard, and just on a national level here, that the, the Republicans are actually in a better position in some ways than if they had taken over the Senate. Because now they've, they've got control of at least one chamber. They can formulate some legislation, send it to the president and his uh, democratically controlled Senate, and if they don't pass it, they can say, look, we, we did our job. We tried. That's absolutely right. And again, what comes with control of the House is chairmanships, and they're going to have a lot of power right now. And now they're both going to do be able to do two things, move their Republican agenda and also be able to put some more blocks, which did not happen before. And we were just reading uh, just a very short time ago that uh, the House Republican leader, John Boehner, has already said that he wants to shelve this uh this uh, health care reform plan, calling it a monstrosity. So that was fast. That, that was fast. But uh, keep in mind, they've been waiting for this day for a few years. They, uh, um, you know, for a while there, when I was growing up, the Democrats were in power for, you know, 40 years. But now the Republicans remember what it was like when they took over before, so they've been waiting for this. All right, let's uh, bring it back here locally here. What was the most significant thing that you saw develop out of yesterday's election here in San Diego? Well, uh, again, on the county supervisors, no big surprises. Prop D, that was clearly the hottest local race, et cetera. And uh, we saw the writing on the wall because the no side had a very well-organized campaign, uh, and they defeated it. And then we had Prop J, the school parcel tax. And uh, uh, even though that got about 50 percent, it needed two-thirds. So those were the main ones that everybody was watching. Looks like that we have a uh, surprise a lot of people in the 6th Council District that we have. A, uh, it's, gonna be, it's going to be Councilwoman Zaff, and uh, that's uh, surprised a few people. And uh, Donna Fry district that was uh, and as Linda was pointing out to me earlier on uh, she knows these two candidates pretty well she said I think they're different people oh very yeah well it's been held by a Democrat for 20 years or something in that district uh, district 6 uh, I'm, trying to remember, I'm yeah. trying to remember who was our predecessor but uh, yeah clear, clearly that uh, Donna Fry did work hard for the Democrat you know it's an person officer but there was a Democratic uh, candidate she worked hard for him but again the people that district that's a district Claremont Mesa a few other areas they're very well well informed electorate uh, I want to take it back to a statewide level for just a second. I know we're jumping around a lot here, but that's kind of how we watch these things, you know, as they, they pop up. Proposition 25, it was kind of sold, and we talked about this, as a way to get lawmakers to, to hurry up and get to the budget, pass a budget. And they said, if we don't pass a budget, don't pay us. That was kind of the smoke screen, though, for what, the, what was really going on there, which means it no longer takes a, what is it, two-thirds majority? to pass a budget. Now you do it with a simple majority. The party in power gets to do that. Guess what? That's Democrats. Both, both in uh, both branches and, and the executive branch. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, what they went on was a soundbite campaign, and guess what? It worked. Uh, again, I'm thinking of the old Abraham Lincoln quote that they uh, fooled some of the people uh, just on election day. <laughs> just on election day. Well, do you, do you see this as, a, as having major implications, or will it really not have that big an effect overall? I mean, we don't know what kind of a budget they will pass if they're unobstructed. Huge implications, absolutely. This is major. This is we we did have several statewide, you know, uh, minor shockwaves, such as the redistricting. That's another big one to watch. You know, again, very kind of people really didn't understand it, but it's going to have huge impacts. One of the propositions that pass is now Congress will be part of the redistricting commission. It wasn't before, so that. But this budget, absolutely, there's no restraints anymore. Now the the party that's in power can get what they want through. Now, was there any big surprises to you when you think about yesterday as a whole? What surprised you the most? There really wasn't any uh, major surprises at all. The ones pretty much a lot of predictions uh, uh, came true, again, both nationally and locally. So it was, again, nowadays, polling's down to a science. Everybody was tracking this stuff pretty closely. Yeah, you know, my brother made that comment. He said, you know, I think these polls are pretty good these days. You don't generally see any big surprises. Uh, what I thought was maybe a little bit of, of a surprise was the gap uh, between Carly Fiorina and Barbara Boxer and Meg Whitman and Jerry Brown. I, I kind of thought those races were going to be closer. They weren't even in the same ballpark in the end. I thought the Senate race would be closer, but on the governor's race, again, I hate to use the cliche, but it's the oldest rule in the book. If they both campaigns would have run a great campaign, it would have been close. 
Jerry Brown ran, ran a brilliant campaign, and we talked about some of his great commercials, et cetera. The Whitman people, quite honestly, they ran a bad campaign, and when that happens, the outcome is pretty how, much... How do you spend $172 million and run a bad campaign? I don't know. Mark, give me $172 million, and I'll let and, you know. And you'll let me know. <laughs> Fair enough. For her, it was chump change, right? Uh, it's funny, and again, as I've said before uh, in our discussions over the past weeks, historically, self-funded first-time candidates lose more than 90% of the time, and this goes down, you know, uh, again, in that statistics, and same with Carly. You know, that brings up a, a larger question across the country, and you look at a lot of the candidates that won. They are, in large part, very, very wealthy people, many of which spent huge portions of their own personal wealth. Do we, you ever envision a day when we get back, get back to a citizen politician? You know, somebody that, that says, you know what, I think I'll go to Washington for two to four years, try to make an influence, and then go back to my, my old job. Well, I don't know about on the national scene, but locally we see that all the time. And again, I'm a, I hate to sound like a Boy Scout here, but our local politicians, we have some great public servants in, and we really do see some people that are really in it for the public good. Very nice. All right, John. Thanks. Thanks you for joining us. We'll bet. see you back a little bit later then. You bet. All okay. right. Think, think about what you want to talk about next. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Coming up, we'll be joined by a San Diego City Council member, Carl DeMaio, celebrating this morning after voters shoot down Prop D. And as we go to break, here's a look at some of the key mayor's races from around the county.